Hello, Derry. Hey, Crystal. Good to see you. <laughs> Hi. Monica from MSA and Darren. Yeah, Monica from MSA. That's good. <clears throat> wow. And a lot of pictures and a lot of names. Um, but that's okay. I don't, don't know all the names. Who is Thomas from Sudbury? Thomas is Sudbury. Hey, that's, uh, that's me. I, uh, 10 years ago, I was involved with uh, Sudbury School in Santa Clara, California for just four months as a staff person. It was one of the highlights of my life to see uh, what young citizens are capable of when they give a, give a space to be bigger. So yeah. um, I'm happy to, this is my first IDEC, so I'm okay. happy to be here with everybody. <laughs> nice. Waiting for people to join the session still. Yeah. So, Crystal, we are also preparing here to live stream your session. So, uh, oh, that's it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. Meanwhile, people also will join. So, yeah. Let's wait for another two minutes if you agree. That's good. That's good. Okay. Crystal, I have to go to a government meeting about youth participation in London in a few minutes. So okay. Apologies for leaving, but I'll be back well before you finish. Okay, good. <laughs> good luck with it. <laughs> Something you have to do. Yeah, you're you're hopping on and off. <laughs> There's Michael from Germany. And Peter, my goodness. Peter's coming to listen to his wife. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny is that, isn't it? <laughs> That's really nice that way around. I like he, he is sitting in space, you see? Yeah. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> Hi, Derry. Have you joined NASA, Peter? No, just some different, uh, different mindset. <laughs> Yeah, we're waiting for a streaming. I think it's now on. I see meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. So this yes. is also something new. Oh, gosh, <laughs> live. You can do it, Crystal. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hi, dear friends, everyone. Namaste. Namaste all the way from Kathmandu, Nepal from Sri Aurobindo Yoga Mandir. We shall start the session now. I will introduce our dear speaker this evening, for this evening, and then she will start her talk. Shall we? Okay, so, so Crystal Hartkamp. Hartkamp, Crystal, is the, am I pronouncing Yeah, it? that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> After studying geology and having finished a PhD at the Technical University in Delft, Crystal worked for more than 15 years in the oil industry and lived with her husband and three daughters in Oman for four years until 1988. We have her husband here, Peter Hartkamp, as well with us. Returning from Oman to the Netherlands, their eldest daughter, became depressed from school when she was eight years old. This initiated a complete turnaround in the life of Crystal and her husband. She started to focus more and more on alternative forms of education and eventually came to the most radical form, the Sudbury model. From 2002 onwards, she and her husband were involved in founding Sudbury model schools in the Netherlands, her deep interest in how children learn in these schools has recently resulted in a second PhD research. Crystal now has almost 20 years of experience with the Sudbury model and her children are adults now. She has published about her experience in books and many lectures. <laughs> Today's conference, she will be talking about, uh, the, the title of her conference is Beyond Childism. In this conference, I'll just uh, read the synopsis of the conference. 
The way children are treated is captured in an image that has been reinforced over the centuries. This has gone so slowly that it is not called into question. Children and young people cannot show how they would really develop outside the context of traditionally grown education. The fear that we will then deprive children and deprive them of their future is great. The question is, is this fear grounded? Or is there a cause and effect reversal here? Are children really vulnerable, innocent, incompetent, and incomplete? Or it is our urge to care for and protect children uh, and keep them in a position of dependence which reinforces this image of them. She will be talking about this topic, this title, and this synopsis. She will now elaborate. Thank you. Let's welcome Crystal, and thank you very much. OK, namaste. And thank you for uh, joining my talk today. And I feel really honored that I'm asked to give this keynote lecture here at the uh, Web uh, IDEC 2020. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great challenge to uh, be able to see so many people from everywhere around the world. Um, and I think it's also a great opportunity that um, uh, the IDEC uh, actually offered us all to, uh, to meet on, yeah, in, in this way. Um, well, as Veda already told, I am uh, Crystal Hartkamp from the Netherlands. Um, and since 2002, I'm involved in democratic forms of uh, schools in the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, from my background, I'm a geologist. I'm not really a trained teacher or uh, anything uh, like that. But because of the enormous experience we have, uh, not only with our own children, but uh, with uh, the, men the schools that I've worked in as well as a staff member and uh, partially also as a founder, I've come to realize that, um, yeah, we are actually stuck in our world, in a worldview on children that is uh, grown uh, over a historic period of time that I really believe that we all start, should start to think about it and talk about it and bring this a little bit further. And that is why I chose this uh, topic today uh, to talk about childism. So what is childism? Um, it is actually a similar term as sexism or racism. It describes treating young children as inferior or incompetent just because of their size or their experience or their status. And it refers maybe a little bit back to the, the lecture Helen Lees gave yesterday about uh, had the missing leadership of women in democratic education, uh, which also was about uh, setting a, a group of people apart from uh, yeah, what became the dominant uh, ideology or the dominant ideas. Uh, but the difference is, I think, that women uh, are adults and um, uh, women are empowered to use their voice and to, uh, to use their influence to change and alter uh, an image that has grown over years. And I think children don't have this status yet. Um, they are not taken serious, seriously and, and they don't have opportunities of influence. And I think we should start talking about it and uh, thinking about it and acting upon it to, to make this uh, a broader idea, to, to take this further. And that's why I wanted to talk about it uh, today. And um, it happens actually... Um, uh, in, very often in education, where adults also have the tendency to, to, to decide what is good for children, and not only about uh, how they, they behave in their situation, but also especially about their learning. Um, and I can give you, to start off with, uh, some examples of what I've encountered in our school or in our surroundings as being childish behavior or what could be childism. And one of the examples is out of a uh, current master thesis that was uh, carried out on um, four former students of our school. And one of those students, uh, he's 25 now, and uh, it's a narrative study. So he uh, talks about his experience in his primary school years 
where his teacher and parents actually decided that he should skip a class and what for what an effect it had on him and his life. Um, and I can quote a small part of it. Um, I just let it happen. I was quite conformed. I thought I couldn't change that. For example, if you consider skipping a school year, right? That was not really my choice. I felt indifferent about it. Either way, my parents and my teachers decided it. Thus, it happened. This was something I realized quickly. I don't have influence on it. And so I just let it happen because I've never been someone who had a big mouth or that would have explicitly gone against it. Subsequently, I would decide on my own plan. And what he recalls um, actually is how he didn't have any influence on his situation in that time, but also how this situation affected him in uh, the rest of his, his uh, uh, evidence is that uh, it was affecting him in a later stage because he was the youngest in, the, in, uh, in his school years. Uh, and even it affected his personality up to the period that he was talking about it now when he was 25 years of age. So it had an, inf an impact then directly, but also it had a deferred impact uh, on his later life. Um, and I think this is one of, of a good example of what childism is. Um, when children don't have any direct influence on their lives, uh, even to the level that maybe their choices may not be our choices, that we just accept them. Um, in the realm of, of democratic schools, um, I can recall also some incidents of uh, what I would describe as perhaps childist uh, behavior or childism. Um, because we've met quite a number of parents, and maybe you recognize that as well, uh, who come to our school and uh, have arguments like, yeah, but my child is only six uh, and therefore is not yet capable. And then, for example, not capable of taking a responsibility or uh, my child is only uh, this age. And uh, yeah, you have to bring him into contact with subjects because otherwise he wouldn't know what is out there. Uh, or, uh, yeah, my, my, child, my child is 12. We had a, a nice example. There was a boy uh, who was actually 12 or 13 years old, and he refused to do his cleaning tasks. Uh, he forgot it all the time, uh, not really forgetting, but he didn't want to do it. Uh, he didn't take responsibility for it. And we have um, uh, cleaning chores in our school. And it is, uh, uh, everybody has to do that. It's just part of our community. We keep our, our surroundings clean uh, ourselves. So everybody had a, has a, uh, a chore to do. Um, and so we went, uh, finally, he, he was sent home and we, we talked with his mom. And then his mom said, yes, but he is only 13. You're too harsh on him. You can't do that. Can't you give him some other things to do? Because he doesn't like to do that. Um, and this in finally ended up that he he had to leave school because um, uh, there was no way that he could take responsibility in our school because his mom kept him in this uh, situation of incompetence and he acted accordingly. Um, so that's actually a very, very sad example of it. Um, yeah, and also if I sometimes visit other democratic schools, I also see sometimes uh, uh, acts of what I could call uh, childism. For, um, for, for example, in schools where they have special arrangements for younger kids um, out of the idea that, yeah, younger kids uh, need a kind of help. They can't do it yet on, their, on uh, themselves. They have special rooms or dedicated staff on the group. Um, where uh, children have um, choices or influence, but not really to the full extent of power over their daily activities all the time. Uh, and where adults sometimes arrange activities, but um, yeah, they're, they're sometimes also not always held for, uh, responsible for their actions. Um, I think it is, uh, it's, it is strange, but it happens and it happens everywhere around us. Um, and uh, I think it is time that it, we start to uh, realize that we need to change this view on children. Uh, so where does it start? And I think it, it starts um, as soon as, as people are capable of seeing children as full human beings 
and that they also can act as full human beings and what is needed for that. Um, I also Googled the word childism on the internet and I found out that it's also not really a, a widespread word. It's not really well known. It's not, you don't get very much hits on it. Um, there is a, a book uh, published by Elizabeth Jung Brühl who, uh, who wrote about it. Um, and there are some, some other articles that you can find on it, but um, I believe it's not really very commonly used word as well. So yeah, it's, it's perhaps time that we should start, start talking about it. So a little bit about um, how I actually came to, uh, to this uh, idea or this, this changing view on children. Um, it actually started uh, when our eldest daughter was eight years old and um, it was in the summer and she was really depressed from school. Um, and she came home and she said, mommy, I, I really, I, I'd rather be dead than going back to school. Um, so at the moment that your child is eight and tells you this, you really know something is wrong. Um, but we looked at our child and we thought, hey, we don't see something is wrong with her. She's she is an eager learner. She was uh, she was very interested and, and curious. Uh, she was a quick learner. Uh, but the way the school was uh, presenting the material and um, the the, re the repetition of the same things over and over and again bored her to death. Um, so that actually was the starting point for us. To, to look for alternatives, to look for other types of education. And we came across the, the website of the Sudbury Valley School. It was back in 2002. And um, the, I, I still recall the first time that I looked at this website and I saw children playing and I read, well, children decide for themselves what to do all day. And I thought, oh my God, what is this for a crazy place? Uh, and I just clicked away the website because I thought this is this is ridiculous. Um, and I think this is the first um, reaction of a lot of people in the world around us as well. If, if they are going, if they are en encountering a school uh, like a suburban school or democratic school for the first time, they think really that it's a kind of children's play playground. Um, but one way or another, um, it sparked something in me and, and I was, I became really curious and my husband as well. So we, we ordered books and we started to read a lot. And then uh, when we read a lot, we started to understand also a little bit better what was really happening in that school. But you really have to deep dig, dig, dig deep, sorry, <laughs> to, in order to, uh, to find your own sources and to find your own information to, to change your own worldviews on children. Um, and uh, yeah, when, when I looked at myself, I thought, yeah, it's not so strange. You, you grow up in your, own, um, in your own, own environment, your grandparents went to, to school, your parents went to school. And so you went to school. So yeah, you sent your kids to school. There, there was never a moment uh, when they were young that I doubted this, um, yeah, this idea. Um, so sending my kids to school was never really a thing I questioned. Um, and yeah, it is, it, it's something that is inherited. Uh, and it was actually from the first democratic school on that we started, uh, that we really realized that we are, had to treat our children in a different way and seeing them much more as, as competent human beings. Um, and obviously it also took quite some time to get used to that idea as well. Um, so yeah, I, I saw how actually my own upbringing affected how we treated our children and what we said to our children. Um, so how did this, this traditional worldview came so dominant in, in our world? Um, and I, I refer to this uh, talk of Peter Gray on Saturday. I don't know if you've heard it, uh, but um, well, obviously you might have heard Peter Gray already talking in more instances as well. But he is telling us that how hunter-gatherer communities are seen as competent in the phase they are in, children are competent in the phase they are in, and also held responsible for their own education. Um, 
So somewhere between our evolutionary past and where we are now in, in our historic time frame, we lost it somewhere. Um, and we don't know very much about the status of children in our most recent uh, historic perspective. But what we do know is that uh, from the mid 17th century on, uh, children became objects of concern uh, by the influence of the moralists and the educationalists of that time. Um, and actually, they introduced this idea that, that a child had to undergo a kind of uh, special treatment or call it an, a quarantine. Uh, it's a good uh, uh, reference to our, our current uh, situations. Um, call it a quarantine to, uh, to, uh, before they could enter the adult uh, world. Um, and increasingly from the mid 19th century on, uh, children became um, uh, seen as more uh, incompetent, in vulnerable, uh, incomplete. Um, and that was probably also encouraged by the, 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 um, the upcoming mass educational systems in that time. And this became the, the dominant worldview that we are still actually inheriting. Uh, only in the time of the, the children's rights chapters, when they were introduced, um, the sociologists in that time, they introduced a, a different perspective on children, more as competent persons, but especially focusing on their rights uh, in, uh, to participate. Yeah, the participation rights, uh, their civil rights to freedom and expression and information, and their political rights to make decisions. Um, and these children's rights gave this different perspective. And there's a lot written about it, actually. Uh, yet the, the child's right chapter in itself had also an other in, unintended effect because, um, because it was needed to create um, a child rights chapter. Um, by that you actually enforce this idea that children uh, need something different from the human rights. So in fact, it actually encouraged this or reinforced this idea that children were a special social group. And then have said this, the, uh, the child rights have never really entered education. And that came because education uh, from their traditions, the deep rooted traditions, uh, was a very hierarchical um, adult uh, dominated uh, uh, system where uh, children are seen as uh, passive educational consumers. So that didn't really contribute to the implementation of the children's rights in education. Um, and is, if I see it uh, here in the Netherlands, uh, it is uh, only the, the child's right uh, uh, the, the, the right uh, to education that is actually enforced and used uh, to create this um, uh, coercive system that children have to attend a school in the Netherlands. Um, because they have a right to education, uh, they have to go to school. Um, and uh, whenever they're in the school, there are no other rights uh, applied. So that is the situation as I see it here. So yeah, um, it, it also seems as if you know, from this perspective, the, the care and protection rights are also placed on top of uh, the rights to participate and to have influence in their situations. Uh, another factor that really didn't help in uh, giving a different perspective on children is the whole science around education, around children's development, because um, science actually focused on development of children in school settings and that has become the standard and it influenced the common belief about children being incompetent because they are constantly assessed by adult norms. Um, and I can actually give a kind of, um, uh, yeah, an, an other uh, idea around it. Suppose that we compare schools with laboratory experiments. As some schools have a more enriched environment and challenging environment, and other schools have a less uh, challenging environment. But in fact, they are all non-natural environments uh, that they are looking at. 
So the, the standard scientific viewpoint is the young person in that um, uh, experiment, in this uh, laboratory experiment. Uh, and because we have been doing this for centuries already, uh, it's not even questioned. And there is a Dutch professor, Rob Martens, and he writes about how the, the mainstream educational system today is actually the largest experiment uh, uh, since 100 years. Um, so that's, that's quite a, a, a thing. And then the educational science actually only focuses on perfecting this experiment uh, and don't even uh, uh, mention it anymore as a prerequisite or as, as a uh, precondition uh, within which the results of their, uh, their outcomes of their uh, research only apply. So what we see is that whatever comes out of research, they say, this is how children are, or this is how uh, children behave, or this is how children uh, are perceived. But that is only true within those walls of these experiments, of course. So looking at it in this way, there, um, uh, from the outside world, there is really a big fear that we will harm children and deny them their future uh, if we don't enforce them to learn by a predetermined uh, curriculum. And the question is, is this justified? As I was writing uh, in, my, uh, uh, in my announcement for this talk, or is there, is there perhaps a cause effect reversal here going on are children really incompetent and incomplete? And does their urge for care and protect, uh, and does the urge for care and protect children keep them in this position of dependence, reinforcing this image actually? So this question is a, a question that we, yeah, we might give answers to if we show the world what happens in other circumstances. So generally speaking, uh, we know very little about how humans develop without formal schooling outside these boxes. Um, because yeah, we've been intervening in this process already uh, for generations. So yeah, the, the world I think is in need of information of alternatives uh, in contrast to what has become the dominant way of schooling. Uh, and this is really a big challenge for all of us uh, in pr practicing democratic forms of schooling, stepping out of the traditional paradigm. Um, yeah, we need to take the world by the hand and go back to our basics. Uh, back to our basics. What? Uh, what? How can we support children's natural capacity to learn in from their environments? Well, I don't need to talk about that because Peter Gray already gave a great talk about it, and he. He's really, uh, he writes about it, he talks about it, so there's a lot uh, that you can find. But what I would like to stress here is that we have to uh, see children as competent in their own right. They have all the skills uh, to develop themselves in the phase that, of life that they are in, and we shouldn't really push them through these phases. We, we need to step out of their way. We have to go back to what makes us human. Uh, and we have to think about how our interventions in their development, development might have an effect on them. And not only in the short term, but also on the long term, as I showed in this, uh, uh, when I uh, referred to this uh, uh, master uh, thesis in the beginning of my talk. Uh, speaking about an effect, what are the effects of the constant intermingling in their daily lives? Um, of course, we, we see a lot of effects because uh, there, there's a lot written about side effects and the by effects of our educational systems, but it, it seems as if people, yeah, uh, as, it, as if the world just accept that as just part of the deal or part of this system. And I think it's not necessary if we change the system. Um, another uh, supportive uh, theory is the, the self-determination theory of Daisy and Ryan. And uh, they stress that all human beings uh, have a need for autonomy, competence and relatedness in support of intrinsic motivation and self-determination. Um, and they say that uh, choice and the opportunity for self-direction seems supporting conditions for uh, intrinsic motivation. 
And the social context is very important around that. Social context can either support or thwart the natural tendencies of, of active engagement and psychological growth. Um, so this is coming from the self-determination theory. And if I take a look at, for example, the, the a Sudbury model school, uh, if I refer to uh, the environment, basic needs in the Sudbury model school are promoted in uh, a supportive social environment where relationships are built on the basis of mutual respect, where there's trust in the individual as a competent person, and where the social structures promote a sense of belonging, where individual freedom and responsibility supports autonomy. Uh, and I think it is crucial that relationships between members in that social context are, are based on equality, with each member in that environment having an equal share in the daily business of the running of the school, also in determining the norms and the values of, uh, of their own environments. Um, it is perhaps to not such a surprise that democratic schools to a large extent support the basic needs for autonomy, competence and, and relatedness better than any other school does. So um, having a free option choice, meaning a choice in which you have a real say about whether you want to do things or even if you don't want to do things is crucial for self-determination. So treating children as competent and autonomous beings who are responsible for their actions and choices is crucial to be able to learn from your own failures and deal with consequences of your own choices. In fact, it all comes back to treating children as competent human beings. And if I refer to, to the book of uh, Greenberg, A Place to Grow in uh, 2016, and in that book, he also refers to uh, what I would call uh, childism. So he emphasizes that equality is so often interpreted differently when people are dealing with children. And he writes, um, they're completely equal, not partially equal, not nearly equal, not gradually more and more equal as they grow older. The whole idea that children grow up gradually doesn't mean that we should treat them as less competent. So in fact, what he writes here is about childism. It is about um, uh, the, the acting uh, upon children as if they are not yet uh, yeah, uh, fit to, uh, to take responsibility or to be competent in what they do and how they live. Um, I think childism is, childism, is, childism is a really deeply rooted phenomenon in, in our cultures everywhere in the world. Um, and it's not really recognized as something negative or so, or, or it's maybe even not recognized at all yet. Um, so one of the disadvantaging situations children have is that um, in, the, the human race has the longest uh, uh, youth period of all mammals and uh, our babies are very very dependent upon uh, uh, their natural caregivers uh, which is also different from some other uh, species and other um, uh, animals so uh, this dependency um, shouldn't mean that we have to keep them dependent on us for a, a long period of time so rather than gradually handing over responsibility over life choices at the time that they ask for it or a time that they're really ready for it um, we try to keep as um, as a society control over their lives and also over their life choices and they are kept in this um, dependency situation um, till up till their adolescence and sometimes even uh, up to their young adulthoods so, and that's not only done by parents, it, I don't blame parents for it, but I think it, it is especially um, happening because of our country's uh, compulsory school systems and the governments. So treating children differently only because of their developmental phase is doing injustice to them as human, as being human. 
And as long as the dominant worldview about children being innocent and vulnerable and incompetent and incomplete isn't altered, um, I think the, the dominant idea uh, that children cannot be trusted to educate themselves will, will prevail. Uh, and what we will see is probably that uh, parents will be insecure uh, about what would happen and governments will be insecure and more and more will be, will be enforced upon our young people to meet the ever rising number of our criteria. So yeah, what is my wish for the future? My wish is uh, that there will be a future without, without childism soon. Um, and, and I believe that we have to raise awareness around it. So uh, start to, to talk about it, uh, thinking about it yourself, looking at how, how we should treat children differently or what, how we treat children, how we speak to children. Um, I think it is all about awareness and I hope to create a kind of awareness here. That is actually my goal. Um, it can perhaps start by calling uh, young people not children anymore. Eh? Calling them children, we, we actually set them apart. Young people are persons growing up with their own talents, wishes, uh, desires and dreams. And we only need to be there for them to give them the opportunity to, uh, to build self-confidence out of our trust as a capable human being. So one way or another, I want to finish with a well-known phrase from uh, Khalil Gibran's verses on children. Your children aren't your children. They are life's longing for itself. Um, and yeah, this is actually what I would like to present. And um, I would like to open up um, a kind of discussion about this topic. Uh, and I, I'm just curious to hear from you what your perceptions are and what your experiences are, and maybe also from your countries, how you look at this topic uh, from this perspective. And do I have to um, give people, or no, just, just unmute, if people can unmute, it's okay. Yeah, they can unmute themselves. Now yeah. we'll open the questions. Uh, you, want, you want to open the questions? You want to open the conversation? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, friends, now you can just hop into the mic and ask questions. This is a very foolish question, but uh, at what age do you decide that children have the competence needed to make a particular decision? At what age from birth um, on? At, uh, when do you decide they have the competence to make that decision? Yeah, in what age? Or not age, but how do you know? Depends on what you mean with um, uh, what they make decisions about. Um, but I think children um, can decide from a very young age on already on their own. Uh, yeah, what what about their own life and and choices? And obviously. Um, you have to realize that uh, from a very young age when they are really baby and, and still needed the protection also for uh, failures, we have to consider also giving them freedom to experiment with life. Um, and experimenting with life starts from a very young age on already, but it progressively have, has to go um, uh, more widely away maybe of our influence and where do you start and where do you end I think from the beginning on they can make decisions uh, and you can at least inform them about um, uh, certain decisions uh, that may be more uh, uh, yeah, that, that are needed in order to protect them from any harm or from anything that might happen so I wouldn't really be a, a, a forestander for um, a full-fledged uh, say over your own life, because I don't think that is realistic, not even at my age, it's realistic. If I have to make a very, very uh, 
dedicated decision about something that affects my life, I will talk with people about it before I will make this decision. And I want to hear perspectives about it. And I also want to uh, consider the, the consequences before I want, before I do something. And this starts already, I think, at a very early age. You, you can start by, um, uh, at an early age with uh, with the food or with uh, uh, they want to take the, they want to to put on their own jackets or they want to do things themselves and it gradually grows of course I, I don't say it comes from one moment to the other but it all depends on the situations and it has to occur in a safe environment You're muted, Fiona. Oh. There are, there are, I don't disagree with anything you've said. Um, there are people who, like Rousseau who would say the adult nature is the only teacher. So if the child is going to put its hand in a fire, so be it, the fire will be the teacher. But I, I was shifting in and out of when you were suggesting that the school, that there is a school that yeah. knows better than the parent for the decision to be made. And it seemed to me that that's a use of authority that's stepping in that has a greater sense of what's appropriate for the child. And I think it's a, uh, everybody, our whole job as an educator is to nurture and support the development of competence. Everybody has competence, but it develops as well through experience. And I just, I find it a fascinating thing as to when we decide <laughs> when it's quote safe or not safe or when. <laughs> so that's all, I think it's a fascinating topic. Well, the, the thing is that there are of course unsafe uh, situations and uh, unsafe situations you have to, to act uh, and that is your obligation, yeah. and. But on the other hand, have said that, what are those unsafe situations? Sometimes uh, we consider something unsafe, which might not be unsafe for the young person to do. Uh, so our overprotecting is also a thing that happens with adults. So we always have to, you always have to consider yourself. What am I talking about? You know, what, and, and if you give this example of a child handing his hand uh, at an, um, a fireplace, I, I believe it's very unsafe to do that because they harm, they will be harmed for life. Uh, and I don't think that is something that you can, uh, you, you really should accept. Uh, on the other hand, uh, burning your hand on some, something hot is also something that we all did and we all know the consequences and we all know that we have to take care about it. So um, there, there, is, there is this scale. Uh, do you prevent children from uh, cooking because they might perhaps burn their finger on, no, we don't do that. We give them uh, a certificate uh, and the certificate in the school is about uh, how you can safely work with certain uh, material or certain uh, instruments. And if you're certified, you're allowed to work with it. Um, right, so my, po you I think my, my point is that we do. So we, we want people to take a risk. We want them to cook. We want them to feel hot. You're right. But at some point, even we, this notion of complete freedom, even we who profess it, at some point make a decision. That That's just, just the thing. And I, it, it's so tough. That's all. But yeah. yeah because that, we want not, the risk taking. Um, yeah. But in a supery school, we never do it uh, directly unless it, there is a real unsafe situation. And then we also have our instruments in place that we have to, um, uh, it, it has to be assessed. So every act that I do that um, is breaching somebody else, his uh, uh, individual freedom is going to be assessed in the school meeting or in the, in, in the structures of the school itself, in the JC. So I can't do things, just because I think it is my um, idea of what is right. It will be assessed later on. So I really have to think twice. Yeah. Can I add a couple?
couple of points here. This is Thomas in Tucson yeah. for Sudbury. And again, uh, I was staff person at a Sudbury school in Santa Clara for four months in the afternoons. And in the mornings, I was a teacher at a regular, also very small school. So I, every day I had the experience of uh, compulsory curriculum versus of the freedom. And I just want to add one thing here, because I we had the same situation too. Uh, we had cleaning chores, and everybody was expected to, to participate in the cleaning of their community. And uh, if that didn't happen, then there was a judicial committee that or somebody would report a violation of a rule that everybody was responsible for, you know, adjusting rules. And there was a whole self-contained process to deal with the situation. So what Crystal came up on was someone who just rejected the whole structure of the community. And then the community has to take care of itself more than take care of the needs of that one child, or not child, but young citizen. And you reach a point where you say, you're, you don't belong here. Sorry, <laughs> we have our expectations. So I just want to add that. So big thanks for everyone being here and what you're doing, Crystal. Yeah, exactly. And it's also not only about um, uh, that you have to do your cleaning chore. Now you're responsible that the cleaning chore is done, uh, which means that you can find other ways <laughs> to, uh, to, to take care of that. So it's all about taking this responsibility. Um, and we even had an example of another uh, boy in a school who didn't like to do the toilets and he paid uh, a euro every time to somebody else who wanted to take over his chores. And that was okay because uh, he took this responsibility. So it's all about, it is your problem, uh, your, your responsibility, how uh, deal with it and how are, how are you going to find a solution for, for your problem. But um, keeping children in a situation where, where parents, and especially this is how it doesn't work in a subway school, you really depend on the support of chair, the parents to support the ideas behind the school. If a parent starts to say, yeah, but uh, he is too young, he can't do it, he's, he is uh, not capable yet. The child can't step up and take this responsibility. That's actually what happened. And that's, that's, that's just sad. And um, yeah, you can't do so much about it. Uh, One more point. But one you more can't point. always uh, find this solution. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but one more point. It's very important that you were pointing in that direction is the business meeting, the weekly business meeting of a Sudbury school. If that young person did not want to have to have a chore responsibility, then the, the expectation was put it on the agenda item for yeah. the community to discuss and see if you can change the rule book, yeah. right? A very powerful educational process. Yes, exactly. That's another thing. Yeah. Yeah, but they can't do it um, only when their parents are really behind them and they start to understand that they have to find their solutions in this school environment uh, to solve their problems. Um, but that needs support from, from home as well. So somebody else, Tareen? Can I, can I jump in here? Okay, hello, my name is Taryn. I live in Johannesburg in South Africa. I have three children um, and in 10 years, we took them through 17 conventional schools. So I'm, I have quite a bit of experience in conventional schools as a mother, not as a teacher. But in the last three years, I've been researching self-directed education and I've become a facilitator at a democratic school nearby. And for the last year, I've been doing that. And I think where a lot of us go wrong as human beings, not necessarily as facilitators or teachers or parents, a lot of us go wrong is that we want a rule book, we want an answer, like when should we let the child be responsible or what is a good time or how should this work? But there's so much more that self-directed education encompasses in terms of communicating with other humans and children and everybody and relationships that you can't say, well, if a child doesn't do their chores, they must leave the school because it's totally situation dependent and child dependent and situation dependent and Parents, it's so many dependents that, that it's, it's more about getting to the bottom of how to communicate and what the actual problem is or what the need is behind why the child can't or won't or refuses or is having a difficulty getting their chore done rather than these are the rules, this is how we do it here. And, and we all look for it. We all want that answer so that we can go follow that list. But the, the biggest thing that I've learned is that there isn't an answer. Each child is 
individual, each situation is individual and we have to learn to be flexible with that in communicating. Yes, yes, and maybe also a little bit uh, no. <laughs> um, of course, uh, there are different situations, yes. Um, and talking with parents and talking with children is, is different uh, between every individual because every person is different. Um, having said that, I think the only way that students really start to understand what responsibility is, is by uh, giving them their options when they are when they choose to be in the school when they really like to be in the school because that is actually the most important thing do you really want to be here you know in the first place do you want to be here this is this is the, the school you choose but do you really want to be here because in this school uh, the community works in a certain way and we have these rules together everybody has to um, yeah, has to to do these these cleaning chores uh, because the community decided that. And of course, you have an you have an influence in this community. If you don't like it, and or if you you want something else, you can put up uh, a motion in school meeting, and you can uh, debate about it and start and try to change things. Um, on the other hand, have said that you you can also uh, learn why the community finds it important that every member has this equal uh, share in this community. So it's not up to us so much as adults in the school communicating about it. It's also about how the community communicates about it. It's about how the students communicate about it uh, in between themselves. Uh, in giving new students also um, uh, the information that they need, uh, how this new school, uh, how it works, because a sub school is, it is really uh, a change over, when, especially when students come from the traditional system into a school like this. Um, so it needs an embedment in not only by us as adults uh, in this sub school. I think most of the work is done by the community itself, but sometimes you, you, you can't get any further. And that's, that's just uh, how, how it works out. That, is, uh, that was one example that I gave, but that's just one example in out of uh, how many years? <laughs> in, the, in the meantime, 15 years of working. So it, it was quite an exceptional example. Yeah. Can I? Hello, can I speak? Yes, D. Yes, um, I thought it was very interesting to hear about that uh, example of a, a person who um, was, uh, I don't know if the word is, basically said, you know, if they can't uh, live with, with the rules or the expectations of the community that they, they don't have to be there. And I understand that from the point of view of choice, but I guess I'm curious about sort of the concept of inclusion, particularly for children or people, um, not, not just children, I guess, who are do have different abilities. Um, and I can see that, you know, you, you want people out of school out of their own choice. So I guess I'm wondering sort of how is that different from say a, a village where, where I feel like there's kind of that concept of inclusivity where everybody belongs mm -hmm. and and I, I guess like at least where I'm coming from that that value is that everyone should be able to find a place and if that and if that's not happening then then something's wrong with that community so I'm just kind of curious on what your take is uh, is that in terms of the actual kind of school um, setting but yeah, you refer to a village um, where I think when you live in a village, you, it, yeah, the only thing you can do is obviously you can move away from the village, but that costs a lot of money and is, is a lot of effort. Um, the thing with our school is uh, children and parents come to visit the school and um, we always assess in the beginning, if the child really chooses to come to our school, if a child says, says no, um, I don't want to be here, and the parents do want their child to come to our school, we say no. We say uh, it's not the child's choice. 
uh, and I believe it is really good that we keep the child in in the lead there for the school because they have to make that decision they have to want to be there uh, and obviously the parents also need to support that but it is the child who is in the lead for making the choice for the school um, and in the school you can learn to take um yeah you, you're in a community whenever you're in a, in a village um there are sometimes perhaps things that you don't like to do so much that that's everywhere if you're going to a work situation um well obviously you will like your work but there will also be some things that you may not like that much uh, and if is if there if there is a certain moment that you start to dislike the things that you don't like so much um if, if that starts to become dominant over the things that you like um yeah you may have to make another decision and find another job or have to go somewhere else and this is exactly how we how it is also in our school as we see it the the first uh i had a thing has to be that the child really really wants to be in the school being part of this community being part of the whole uh, surrounding and from that starts also taking this responsibility for their own environment for their own um, surroundings for others to take care of others as well you know it's not an individual concept it's it's quite a, a communal uh, concept as well but the flexibility of the community stops where the the individual starts to breach the uh the norms and the values of the community and when the community is harmed in that way um yeah then you have to have a question to a person do you really want to be here because it works this way or you have to try to change it. and if you can't change it if the, the majority of this community don't want to change it then yeah you may have to make another decision or just accept the situation as it is and i think it is just a real life situation you can have it everywhere is this the an answer to your question uh yes thanks so is somebody else uh wanting to add something or ask something or i would uh. Ooh. I would, Bridget. My name's Bridget. Wait, I'll turn my camera on. Um, okay. Bridget. Um, yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> um, in Turkey, talking about, you know, there are children with different ways. There are humans with different, sorry, my screen is being obnoxious. Um, you know, there are students who have different styles of being in the world and different ways of, um, you know, in my work, we 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 don't refer to disabilities, um, but we'll say we will say that um, I work in early childhood. Uh, we will say that children have special rights, and so a child that maybe can't function in a certain way or with a certain environment or you know whatever is going on, like then they have a particular. We have a responsibility to their right that's different. So as an adult, you know, creating an environment where children are going to learn together, you know, what's our responsibility to a child who say can't, you know, whatever, sit still for as long as the other children to listen or watch something or, um, you know, can't deal with loud noises or gets very confused if too many people talk at once and suddenly they're emotionally, you know, just, just, can't control their themselves. So, you know, how does that play? I think that that's a, that's a question like that uh, Dee was saying about the village. So, you know, when there are people of different capabilities, then where is our responsibility as, as um, the leaders of that environment to support their ability to participate? Oh, um, yeah, we, we don't enforce participation, in fact. So if we've had students who, um, yeah, who had had the, the similar uh, type of um, uh, energy that you described or, or uh, problems or whatever, um, 
So we've had children who uh, who were overactive, um, and whenever they started to become overactive and too loud in in the surroundings, we just asked them to go outside and uh, go go out and run uh, for a moment or do something active, and but not inside. Um, so they they can. Um, they can find their own spaces and, and we don't enforce them to be really always in the community. We have we also have uh, had students who uh, came in the school and uh, wanted to sit on their own in, in a single room and uh, started to do their own thing with music on. Uh, so it's not really not being um, uh, particularly uh, around in, in that environment, but it is all about making your own choices in that environment. So if, if you feel that you want to uh, distance yourself at a certain moment, or if you feel that it's, it becomes too much for you because of, uh, of the, the noises, or you can sit somewhere else, and uh, you can just escape from the situations that you're in because you're not enforced to stay in the situation that you're in. Um, and this also had a big effect on especially HDHD students in our school. Uh, at least we had a few of them that one of them uh, stopped using Ritalin and uh, was really, really very active, especially after drinking some uh, energy drink. And um, uh, so there's somebody on the door now. But um, on the other, uh, he, we just told him, well, okay, well, oh, you drank some energy drink. Well, good luck. Just uh, see you uh, next, uh, next day in uh, JC again, because usually he started to, uh, to, to bump around and, uh, and, and breach the, the, the rules of the school. And, uh, but at a certain moment, he realized, okay, if I drink my energy drink, I become a little bit uh, overexcited. Uh, uh, I better go outside then half an hour after that, and then it's gone. So he started to, to, um, uh, to, yeah, to, uh, to help himself out of this situation and to find solutions for his own situation. And it's all about supporting children uh, giving them sometimes some reflections, but um, uh, giving them also the space to, to discover and to, um, uh, to find their own solutions for the problems they have. But he finally, he was fine. He, he went out, he did a uh, higher education after that. And um, yeah, he, he, he managed to, to deal with his own energy levels. So I think that is, that's really good. That is, that's how it, I think we should work with with young people, give them the opportunity to to um, to find their own solutions for for whatever personality they are. Can I can I just add a conclusion to that question? Um, I I have a I have a, I I believe that there's a responsibility on our part to understand how every individual child learns. And I, and, I find, and I feel this very strongly because of my own experiences. I work as an artist creating learning spaces with visual languages with young children. Um, and I experience all the time how um, you say a child like the one you describe without the energy drink, um, but with you know, ADHD ability, you know, that, that oftentimes that child when at a table with a lump of clay sculpting, will engage in a very long, very intense, reveal intelligence that adults around them have not experienced only to realize that, oh, this child, and that's where the individuality comes in. And I just wanted, you know, I, I just want to impress that I, don't, I think that finding ways to support individual ways of learning of being right because children are also different is part of our responsibility so that they can be a part of the group and not always yeah. be being you know given the opportunity to find a solution to be out of the group 
Well, that is that is true. But that, uh, on the other hand, uh, students who have really problems with uh, sensitivity, for example, they sometimes like to to be outside and sit on their own and do their own thing. And that is also something that we have to respect. And I think this individuality is um, I don't know if it is really an adult um, uh, responsibility, but I think it's a responsibility as a community or as as uh, as as a world to understand that uh, every person is different and every person needs different things um, and there is not a one size fits all solution it's not there um, so yeah you you have to step out of their way you have to give them the space to uh, to start to understand how they are functioning because sometimes they also don't know how they are functioning yet and that's also good so start to understand how you are and who you are and and what you want to be Could I um, add a bit to that? Because I, um, hi, I, I work in a, um, a Sudbury style setting in the UK, um, and my specialist area before I started doing this was um, was working in um, in SEN with with kids with additional needs, um, and I find the the Sudbury setting to be the most inclusive environment I've ever worked in, because it's such an individual response to to it, each child. Um, and the community takes a responsibility for supporting each individual to find the way that works for them. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of the perspectives um, that we're hearing in the group about um, supporting individual needs and how it's the adult's responsibility to provide for those individual needs is actually out of context for what you're talking about, Crystal, because you're talking about a sub setting yeah. Yeah. where the whole community takes responsibility and the individual takes responsibility, not the adults it's for everybody to support so it's not the adults responsibility to provide for those needs yeah exactly that's exactly what it is yeah and um, sorry i i also wanted to then ask um just on a separate point um about the the view of childism um in parents um so parents coming to the setting um and something that we struggle with is where the parents and the child say yes definitely we want to be here we want to we want our this for you know, I want this for myself or I want this for my child um, and they sign up and they're they're really enthusiastic about it but then in getting to know them you discover that actually their home life is very different to the setting um, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of childism going on and trying to um, support the parents along the journey of, of, of um, improving that or kind of into a more kind of egalitarian relationship and I was wondering how much you would suggest is the setting's responsibility to do and how much you would put on the parents as kind of their own responsibility to, to educate themselves with that? Yeah, we, that's a very interesting question because uh, at the moment we are now uh, talking about how we should support parents much better in this process because parents are coming, what, what I described as well, they come from totally different place, you know, from their backgrounds, their, their parents, their grandparents did a certain type of schooling and they worked with their, their kids in a certain way. So, um, and parents are not in the school. So the, the child has an advantage because it is in the school and it can experience their, uh, their new uh, way of working, but the parents are lagging behind, literally. And um, we are now talking actually about uh, it, it's rather strange, but we, we might want to do it to, to start a kind of course for parents, which we want to make mandatory for parents to, uh, to have a kind of in-depth understanding of how this school works and what is needed also from their uh, home environments to support their child to be successful in the school. Because it, for the child, it's such an enormous... Um, uh, yeah, risk as well for, for the parents as well, but for child as well, when, when parents aren't really uh, supportive and start to uh, start to get cold water uh, freight or how do you call it? And they, uh, yeah, they, they undermine actually uh, the, the child taking this responsibility and taking, um, uh, becoming self-directed in the school. Uh, so it's very, very important to, to get parents on board and uh, to educate them. So we, we actually are thinking about uh, giving them a kind of course. Yeah. 
Is that an answer to your question? Uh, yeah, uh, this is me, Ram from the Center for Learning and Children's Rights Center. And I had uh, curiosity about, uh, you said the children, young children have a right or choice to go, whether to go to the school or not, so that if they don't have to go to the formal school at the time, what content do they have to study? Or maybe if they, if they want to go to the school, then uh, they have already, they have got a choice or that is children's right to uh, get education. But is, is there any age limit for the students or how they decide what to study or is there any particular curriculum that is, uh, uh, that is made for the young children? Or do they have a choice or whatever they like, they can do engage them. Yeah, no, in, in a Sudbury model school, we don't work with any curriculum at all. No, uh, the only obligation in the Netherlands we have is that we have to track uh, their progress on whether they learn uh, reading, writing and arithmetic. Uh, and, um, and that's how we, that's what we do by just looking at their daily activities, what they are, what they are doing and what, how they are functioning in the school and their uh, a lot of uh, situations where they actually uh, are confronted with reading, writing and arithmetic in, in the daily life. So that's not really a problem. The, the problem is that it's quite uh, a lot of work to do. <laughs> but uh, no, we, we don't have it from a, a young age and that is from around four years old. It depends a bit. Um, there is an article by Daniel Greenberg on the, I think you can find it on the internet. It is uh, from four years and older or something like that. Um, and it's about how children uh, from that age on uh, start to have this sense of taking this responsibility and um, having a, can have a, an influence and are, can articulately talk about what uh, what they're uh, what they need and how they um, how they uh, have to function in 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 their daily lives um, but uh, yeah for the rest we we don't uh, organize anything the only things that are organized are by the are organized by the community itself uh, out of interests of people sometimes um, there is a kind of cooking activity going on or we we go on an excursion or we go to the woods or we we uh, we do some other things or there are people talking or well there there are all kind of activities in the school happening and people can go there and and talk uh, and and look what others are doing and what you see with young children that they're sometimes they uh, come to the older people in the school, older students, but sometimes also to adults, um, and they look what you're doing or they 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 just um, observe everybody else what they are doing, uh, and from observing they also learn quite a lot. So yeah, it's uh, it's an open community. So every uh, all the ages are mixed uh, together so that certainly you might have a, a very uh, variety of activities for the different age group students so that they uh, in the beginning uh, when the student is admitted in the school as a formal school so that in the beginning he or she might have to be, to be engaged with a certain type of activities and that is to be advanced when he or she crossed over six months or after a year so that there is to be variation and uh, maybe at the at the last of uh, com at the completion of that particular age group so that students they might be given a particular report cards and certificates for their secondary school or they don't have don't need that no no it doesn't work like that it, we don't have any uh, particular age groups or work with particular age groups or have uh, specific things for different age groups no the only thing what happens in the school is that uh, certain age groups start to do things sometimes together uh, because they, that is something that really uh, that they are engaged in uh, themselves. Like, for example, uh, Dungeon and Dragons. That's a, yeah, there was a, a small group of students that started Dungeon and Dragons. But in the end, uh, I saw that also a young person, one of our youngest students, uh, also joined one of the sessions. So. You see, whatever is going on in the school, uh, students can join uh, freely if they desire to do so. Crystal? 
This is Thomas. Yeah. Uh, if I can just take a, a few seconds here to help describe what Sudbury Day is like. It's important people realize that it's very similar to a clubhouse where you have a self-regulated society operating within it. And uh, that's the essence of it. The, the real important thing when it comes to learning is the richness of the environment within the clubhouse so that people have the ability to pursue their interests according to their own choices moment to moment. So uh, that's the structure. Yeah. Over. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, is there another, somebody who wants to say something? Yes, um, this is Dilipa, I'm from Sri Lanka. Oops, um, I uh, just logged on. I think you can hear me twice. Can you hear? I don't know, oh, there I am. Yes, oh, yeah. no, I, yeah. I, I, was, I was logged in from two because my connection is so bad. Um, yeah, uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. No. Great. Um, yeah, so Crystal, thank you very much for this very inspiring talk that you gave. Um, and I, I thank you really because I didn't know the term childism until I heard you speak. So that's really great. And I did a quick Google search and there's a lot of material. So I'm going to like get my hands on it and read up on it. Um, I was, I've been reflecting on this specific question a few days now because of conversations that we've been having with parents. We, we are on the verge of starting a self-directed education democratic school in Sri Lanka. It will be the first of its kind. So lots of questions from lots of parents. Um, one thing we find difficult is, you know, there seems to be some confusion between child protection, child rights, and schooling in the sense, you know, this is a different kind of a school, um, but you know, it doesn't have a curriculum, it doesn't have exams. Are we sort of depriving the child of their rights to a proper education? So I think it's, it's really difficult when we get to that child rights thing, child protection, is this space good is this is not that kind of school um this is not the kind of school that we are used to is this some really weird model so uh, this this uh, this confusion about what is our role to protect the child um and, and this overprotection of the child um may actually disempowering the child as you said you know the child isn't able to uh, clean up after himself and one, the mother wants to protect the child and say look, look you know so I think we are in this space that there's a lot of confusion around certain um, our adults role as, as, as making a safer environment and losing the, in the process, taking away the empowerment somehow. And I'm wondering how do we deal with that? You know, the child protection, child rights, and giving the child the freedom to learn and the freedom to explore. This seems to be a struggle for many people. Yeah. Um, well, it is a struggle. I, I don't know how uh, well-known democratic schools are in Sri Lanka because it 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 uh, if 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 I hear you, um, I think back to the beginning time in the Netherlands when um, when when the first democratic school started here in the Netherlands. It was really a battle because um, the whole world doesn't understand what you're doing and, and uh, people coming to your school and even yourself, you, you, I was also still quite insecure perhaps in, um, yeah, what we were doing, was that the right thing? And uh, so um, the, the thing is, um, the only way to do it is by reading a lot just read a lot and, and read a lot especially for example from peter gray or some books or uh, that you can get hand on um that is about democratic schools there are many books around from different democratic schools um but but uh, be be very 
uh, secure about what you read and your confidence in the model in uh, giving children really this space where they can define their own education in this community. And, and I still stress it, I think this community is key. The age mixing and the community is key in support of um, a child taking their autonomy and their uh, building their autonomy and competence and um, and develop themselves. Um, and yes, it's 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 a struggle. It's a, it's a it's a constant struggle. Start to to try to write things yourself or uh discuss with people um but also be honest about your fears i i would say be honest about it and say yeah well uh and find somebody perhaps also in your neighborhood or somebody else that you can sometimes contact and uh, get a little bit more confidence about your your own ideas because fear doesn't re it, it doesn't matter, but it shouldn't uh, take an overhand. And um, because when out of fear, people start to control again. So I think talking about it and finding uh, people that you can talk with who, who are more knowledgeable, that who can support you in, uh, in this process of uh, starting this school. Yeah, that might help as well, I think. And dealing with parents, it will be an endless struggle. It, it's still a struggle here in the Netherlands. You dealing with parents, it's um, uh, you have to keep uh, on uh, educating them and talking about the model and uh, telling them how important it is to trust their child and uh, give the child uh, the support uh, they need in order to become self-directed. Yeah. That's right. I feel, Crystal, that uh, a democratic school, a self-directed education school, do not enroll a child. It, in fact, enrolls a family in a way. In a way. Yeah, Ex exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, somebody else? M maybe. Ah, Monica? Hi. Yes, well, you, I I support the Sudbury style, and we've organized oh. uh, at, in Calgary, Canada, a Sudbury-inspired homeschooling co-op. But for more like practical application, um, so we uh, we're supposed to see the children as competent and capable, but we also rent a space that if we isn't cleaned to a certain standard we could run the risk of being booted out. So when we had the children, it was their responsibility to clean the space and the facilitators also helped. But if we left it for the kids to clean, like their standard of clean would never be good enough to maintain the space. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how, how would you deal with that? I found it a constant struggle to get the kids to clean it to the, to the clean enough <laughs> the standard that would be needed, right? Yeah, Are they I think that, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a different situation than um, uh, I think that um, if you really have this obligation to have a, a certain level of cleanness in order to be able to keep this uh, space, um, I think you should just uh, decouple that of the cleaning chores and just keep cleaning chores to a level that uh, the everyday work is done. But then, in fact, as a staff, I think you're uh, obligated to to make sure that um, that that the space is cleaned up to the level that you can keep it, and then you might have to hire perhaps a cleaning um, uh, a cleaning organization or whatever. And I know certain uh, Surbury schools that have um, that have uh, the money uh, when they grow a little bit gr bigger. Uh, to have a special uh, person cleaning after the days uh, doing the, the most of the work. But what I've understood, for example, from the Jerusalem Sudbury School, they kept in place the, the cleaning chores because 
the students in the school meeting said, we find it uh, such an important um, uh, means to build our community, to build this feeling of uh, that we take care of our own environment, that we don't want to skip the entire cleaning in our school. So they kept cleaning chores and still they had uh, a cleaning later after the, after the end of the day. Yeah. Can I make a suggestion? Can I, I share what we share do? Some. Yeah. Um, so um, what we do is uh, we have um, tidy up teams. Um, so, and each team has a team leader um, who is elected by their team, but is someone who is capable of doing the cleaning to, to the higher, to, you know, to the standard that is needed. And they then supervise their team. So you'll have a group of kids of mixed ability in or mixed competency in terms of the, um, the cleaning. And then they're, they're kind of su supervised and supported by um, an older or a more, just a more capable child in terms of the cleaning um, so that they work together as a team to get it up to that standard. And that way, the, the, the younger ones learn how to do it better, um, but the job gets done to a sufficient standard so that it is actually clean and tidy. That's also a possibility. Yeah, thank you, Lucy. Um, I want to give Monica from uh, Super School Amazé the word. <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> I'm Monica. Um, I want to go back from, back, uh, from the cleaning, <laughs> uh, back to what you uh, mentioned, Crystal, about reading a lot to to make yourself uh, strong and believing in the model or in self-directed education. Um, I, I want to mention, uh, I travel around the world and I visit, I don't know, 14, 15 democratic schools and 10 Sudbury schools and free schools. So I, I really know practical difference between different kind of school. And what I experience that the Sudbury, the visiting Sudbury model schools was much, much more challenging for myself and bring up much more fears than other schools. And I think there is a huge difference about this environment where more offering happen or more the, the stuff mean you have a bit more responsibility and yeah, or it's really consequent in that. And um, yeah, I want to mention that it's not only reading, it's really about uh, meet your own own fears and I want to share a situation I, I had in the Golan Highs so when I when I travel around I was a lot of bored yeah in the it was like a student I was like a student to yeah to discover this kind of school because no one of the staff members said hey Monica you have to do that now or that I was really have to find myself in this year I travel through Sudbury schools and in the Golan Highs I really I doubt everything this school model cannot work and the kids are bored and there is there is I was really judging and then I realized it was my my really own deep condition I had that I have a value if I do something and I had to allow myself just to be and to come down and not to do anything or really to relax first. And when I had this experience deeply in myself that I am enough or completely the way I am, I don't have to uh, uh, function or anything. All this what happened in, through our education, then I see everything through our other filter. Yeah. I could see the value of the Sudbury School and the beauty and uh, the growing and the kids and accept that the part of boring is very, very important process to find yourself all this but I had to go through this too and I think this is a very that's why I right now we don't have the school I don't know if everyone knows but the government closed our school uh, and we try to fight for reopening but right now with the coronavirus in Bavaria I feel like the energy is more against self-determination mm -hmm. so I decide to travel around the world and want to make workshops especially for educator or to people who really want to go inside and find this trans transformation in themselves to, to feel more free and more themselves. And then you can allow the, I don't want to say kids, the young people, uh, also more the freedom. It's, a, it's really inside us and our condition. It's, I think everyone knows that who, who work in Sudbury school, but it's, I yeah. experience it's a huge difference to other free school or democratic schools. So that's what I want to share. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody else wants to say, Peter? 
Um, yes. Uh, I've seen it already. Um, oh, can you hear me? No, not really good. Okay. Um, yeah, to coming back on childism, and I think while, while the word childism or the meaning of childism is so important for democratic schools, is in my experience, um, um, if you talk to parents or you talk to other people about school, um, the childism is almost like an overarching um, idea. If parents say you will, yes, be that, uh, then that really governs to all the discussions you have. If you don't, if you do not take children children seriously and as competent people, um, then you it's very difficult to have a discussion with parents if they don't take them seriously and you seriously. The best test for Peter? Um, yes? Your, your uh, sound is not really good. Okay, I'll walk inside. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, but uh, the ultimate test about childism is if you if people talk to children uh, differently than they talk to their partners, their parents, their friends, their colleagues. Uh, and a lot of times you see people when they talk to younger kids, they they uh, they change, they increase the tone of their voice or they say things in a different way. And the test is for me is always, if you say something to a child in the same way as you would say to your partner or your, your colleague or your neighbor, uh, then it's okay. But if it's different, then you really have to think why it's different and why you do it differently. Um, and I think as a, as a uh, the whole, the childish look, basically, in the way of treating children has a major impact in, in democratic schools. Oh, that was it. Okay, thank you. Somebody else wants to add something? Just for a second. I, uh, I have one. Go here. ahead. Yeah. Who? Who is speaking more, Thomas and? Okay, I'm, I'm Bim from Bim. Nepal. Yeah. Okay, I have one query regarding the democratic education system and conventional education system. Exactly in democratic education, there is no any curriculum, there is no any examinations and no syllabus, and we give priority to the student's choice. That's fine. And. <clears throat> In government school, there is curriculum and there is just some test exams as well. And suppose our students, they wish to join the government school from the democratic school, school. And at that time, the government school, they expect some standard. So we do not have any such document or let's say certificate for the students. Uh, so this is a contest in Nepal. So what about the Israel or other countries? How? Uh, we are uh, doing the equivalence in government school and democratic education. Um, maybe I don't understand your question really well. Uh, Bim, what, do you say that you have a kind of assessment at the end or what, what is it? Uh, yes, in government, uh, government school, uh, uh, there is one standard or let's say assessment system, examination system, and they provide at a certain level of certificates to the students. And suppose our students from the democratic school, they wish to transfer to the government school. And at that time, government school, they expect some sort of the certificate from the students. Ah, OK. And, that's... OK. Uh, yeah. At that time, there is a problem. So what is the system in other countries like you? Yeah, in, in our country, it is, um, uh, there is no uh, obligation to have a kind of certificate from our school uh, that has to be handed over to another school. Uh, but other schools can um, ask to, to, uh, to test the, the child or to, to let the child do a kind of test assessment 
uh, before it uh, it comes into a traditional school. But we've had several examples of students that also went from our school to a traditional uh, regular uh, school. And um, yeah, they all uh, moved in quite smoothly, actually. And um, there was no, no real uh, test or whatever uh, needed from our school. Um, yeah, it's the, the thing is at higher education, uh, sometimes um, they ask really for, uh, for entry exams or for exams. And we have had several examples of students from our school who had been doing some entry exams before they went to higher education. Uh, and some, uh, they are just doing some regular uh, 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 diplomas. So the, uh, the high school diplomas and then finally go to uh, whatever higher education they want to go to. But it's not um, organized in the school. It's all, uh, uh, you can do state exams in the Netherlands. So you can, you can go to do some state exams and then um, you can, uh, you can have your entry uh, certificate yourself. Okay, good. Crystal, um, this is Dilipa again. I have another question. Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned that um, in the Netherlands, there is some sort of um, government needs to know that they have, they have certain maybe literacy, numeracy sort of skills, competencies, and that you um, need to sort of manage that expectation. So can you explain, like illustrate how you do that in the Sudbury model where, where there is no curriculum or exams to support that? Yeah, but the way that we do it is, um, we we log activities in the school and we write what kind of activities that there uh, are taking place and um, uh, who attended the activity and uh, we have uh, one teacher who is actually making this uh, transformation or translation into the skills that are needed uh, in order to be able to uh, to act in such an, an activity or um, yeah, we, when we when we have, for example, when you're in the JC Judicial Committee, you you have certain roles there, and uh, one of the roles is that you have to read out uh, the rules loud, and uh, so at a certain moment when children are capable of doing that, you have a very very um, good example of uh, well, a person can read, of course. But before that, um, you can see when children are doing math in in cooking activities or in other activities or doing reading, uh, like reading on their computer or reading um, whenever you're around and uh, you see what is happening around you. Um, so in fact, what we try to do is to, to, to see those uh, points in time where, where students show some progress and that is what we track. And that's enough, we don't need to, so to go further. Have, huh? So you need to maintain some sort of a journal. You need to maintain some sort of a journal or a record for each child. That's that's something you do, right? Uh, no, we don't do it for child. This journal, this journal is actually done on the activities in the school. Uh, so show the uh, video just to we write, we write about but it. I don't know whether you heard me. So that means you need to maintain or you're maintaining a journal or a record. Yeah, we have to maintain a, a report. That's that is what we have to do. Yeah, that's an obligation. Okay. Yeah. Somebody else? Yeah, Chen. Uh, Marcel, after that, please. Uh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, I just, uh, I kind of missed the first uh, half part of the meeting. So if the question I've been asked, I'm sorry. Uh, so my question is, is there any suggested environment 
for starting a Sudbury school. Uh, uh, I am in a group in Taiwan right now, and we're trying to start a uh, Sudbury school. But we found it's kind of difficult right now because we can't find many students since it's a new concept of ed education. And uh, not much parents can accept this kind of, uh, you know, uh, concept to educate a child. So uh, there aren't much student for us and uh, another problem is to find a location uh, see in Taiwan Taiwan it's a it's an island and it's a city so oh uh, where we live it's a city so mostly we have buildings and it's not like the Sudbury Valley in USA like uh, a valley a trees and you know gardens there are no such things like that in the city mostly we have tall buildings and roads and if there's a park nearby that that's really lucky but maybe not so in um the problem is we can imagine if a kid we don't give them any class or any curriculum and we don't teach them anything uh we expect them to learn by themselves but there is no there's no trees and there's no there, there there's no big garden and there's may, just maybe a, a a room and maybe video games and will that work for Sudbury or maybe two or three people there's no stimulation uh, between them right so how are they going to uh, discover the the, their interest or you know the variety of uh, the road is, is there any suggested size like that well size is, is an issue I think um, and you don't need to be that big but uh, at least I would say you, it starts to become a little bit like a, a good functioning community from 20 students on uh, but rather having 30 than 20 in fact so um in the last school we also had two little students and and i didn't really think it didn't work it worked but um it's much yeah it's much better when you have a little bit of a bigger school and when it's too small i'm not really sure so uh i i think you really need um need to have at least an uh, a vision of growth and uh, an environment where you have a feeling that you can grow your school. So it doesn't really matter if you start with a few, but then you still have to have a kind of situation where you, at least you can grow up to a 30, 40 students minimum. Um, and uh, that, that's just a question if, if that's going to happen. That's also something for your location. Um, uh, yeah, does it matter if you don't have trees and outside space? I don't think so. It, it, is, um, it is all about uh, your own country and your own situation. You have to realize that that is your, the limits that you have to work with. Um, I know that the Surbury School in Lille in France, uh, they don't have outside space either. They, they have inside space and they did deliberately dedicated one of the rooms uh, as being an activity room where the children can go and, and be more rough and, uh, and play uh, and run and, uh, and do their things. So it, it is all about how are you going to deal with your situation. But um, yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you, thank you. And then was Marcel, I think, where's Marcel? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Crystal. Uh, uh, my question is about the last question that was before. So you mentioned that you are forced a little bit to, to take note of all the things uh, that the, the kids are doing. Uh, my question is whether this is not only, um, how you say in English, um, it's not only a weight, but also an opportunity or even if it had an effect, a positive effect on to be more conscious about the processes 
uh, or even if there were happening some some things uh, in the kids that has changed the quality of their learning of or of their development so if we we notice that uh, while writing the things down i'm not really sure we, we don't use it really for our internal processes but obviously it's a, it's a very um it's it's a very nice way to see what kind of activities there are happening in your school and um yeah what what the the vibrancy is in activities what what the, the engagement is in activities and how uh, students themselves come up also with uh, all sorts of ideas to uh, to initiate and um and i believe there we i i still believe that we miss out actually most of the skills that children learn by doing this it's a ridiculous system it's 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 only it doesn't even say anything about the development of the children of course it doesn't tell you anything because um we can't look in their heads you can't see what is happening if a child is sitting on a sofa um doing nothing a whole day um is he really doing nothing What's happening here? We can't look inside their heads. So I believe that we always miss out what is really, what, what the real education is, what is going on there. And by writing this down only for the government, um, I think we miss out most of what the, the real depth of the learning that's taking place in our, in our schools. So I, we only see it as an, um, something we have to do to please the government. It's not something that we use inside the school. It's also not something that we share, also not with the students. The students can ask for it. They, if they want to see what we're doing, they can look at it. But we're not going to share it, not to the parents, not to, it's just deliberately only for um, the, the requirement uh, to, the, to the authorities. So yeah, that's, that's actually the sad thing. I think we are doing something that we don't know the depth of uh, the learning that's taking place. Yeah. So okay, Crystal, we, we can take one more last question or comment yes. and then I have uh, announcements to make. Uh, Fine, uh, so that's we good. can take one more comment, okay? So who is the last one? I'm happy to say something, Crystal, Thomas, and okay. Tucson again. Thomas. I just want to I just want to celebrate Sudbury. Just a few more seconds here, because the Sudbury model is a is a model of adult society in a democratic nation, right? We're preparing the young people to understand what it means to be an adult in a in a uh, democratic culture, right? So. Uh, we don't go around and make sure that everybody's algebra is measured up to snuff in adult society no. right so it doesn't fit in the the for the young people it harms them to do that approach and it's definitely childism right we're treating them away which really makes them smaller when we force them to pass tests that somebody else has decided they need to learn we don't treat adults that way we should not treat the young citizens that way either and that's uh, my celebration thank you very much Thank you for this last comment and thank you all for uh, yeah, having uh, been here and I really enjoyed it and I want to tell you that on Thursday uh, I actually started an, um, a kind of uh, informal meeting about talking about Sudbury so if, if people want to join you're welcome I think it, it also starts at three o'clock and I don't know how to announce that so I will ask the, uh, the, the persons from the conference uh, how to make that more uh, open to everybody sure. who wants to join. Sure, Crystal. Yeah? I, I think we can send out the information uh, to all the participants, all the yes. IDEC uh, registries. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Crystal, very, very much. And uh, we are hoping to see you, if not sooner, in IDEC 2022 here in Kathmandu, Nepal, in our big family. We would like to accommodate you in our big family of 200 kids, 200 children. Let's not say children. <laughs> <laughs> just you have said but uh, for the moment let's say 200 children and 50 adults uh, we would really love to have you here you are all you're really welcome here well i really would like to come and um yeah actually uh, my daughter uh, the eldest daughter she went to nepal last year and she did a big hike there 
um, and we didn't even know that there were democratic schools there. So um, yeah, we missed an opportunity maybe. <laughs> great, great. It would be nice. It will be really nice to have you here. Thank you so much. And all the participants, all of you are really welcome here. You know, where are the foothills of the uh, like Himalayas in the sense big hills? But from here, you can see all the Himalayan range. We are just outside of Kathmandu city. You have a lot of space to stay. We have uh, plenty of space. Like we can accommodate hundreds, uh, like more than 100 people at a time. So well, you, you are most welcome. And before we finish uh, with, the, uh, with this session, I would like to make a few announcements regarding the web IDEC. Uh, probably some of them are going to be repetition. Uh, so we have Barbab Space, so please, uh, those of you who do not know what Barbab Space is, Barbab Cafe, all of you can uh, join in there. It's like a hangout place, informal hangout place. You can just go and chit chat. We haven't been uh, using a lot, but uh, I think uh, slowly it's building up. Mm -hmm. I'm ready. Um, yeah, and then we have next talk is by our friend from Kenya, Nairobi. She is Eunice Uino. She will be talking about, uh, just a second, she will be talking about, uh, sorry, I, I don't remember in my head. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she'll be talking about QR codes, a tool <laughs> built for teachers shortly after five minutes. And another thing is, I, uh, I would like to just humbly request all the participants, those who can, to uh, make some, because it will be, because the whole conference is going to be free for everyone to make it inclusive. So let's just, you know, to keep it surviving. Uh, your sound is breaking up. Have that in the your future sound, as well. Your sound is breaking up, Beta. Can you hear me? Now, yes. Okay. So regarding the donation, like uh, to survive way by deck, it's important that all contrib contribute in our own way, whatever we can. So for the moment, that's it. Uh, we have uh, the next speaker coming up. We'll go out for five minutes and then we'll be back with our new, another speaker, very important and very interesting speaker again, yet again. So thank you very much. See you in five minutes.